On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don and I'm a consultant in life sciences. I work with companies across life sciences all the way from pharmaceuticals all the way through to medical device. And um, we're working right now on a series of uh, workshops uh, called Thoughts at Scale. And you could sign up for those by going to the link at the very bottom of this page, thescalingmethod.com forward slash thoughts at scale will take you there. What you do is you'll sign up there and then I will send you a meeting invite and uh, you'll be able to join. This week's topic is actually on attention, attention around your strategy and your vision inside of your organization. So again, trying to help organizations think about the things that impact their ability to scale. So with that, I wanna bring in our guest. In this episode of Life Science Success, my guest is Dr. Jim Woody. He's the CEO of 180 Life Sciences. Dr. Woody leads a pioneering team of science, scientific innovators at 180 Life Sciences, a clinical stage biotechnology company. So with that, welcome to the show. Thank you, Don. Yeah, thanks a lot for being on. I really appreciate it. And uh, just to kind of hop in here, could could you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I'm a uh, pediatric uh, immunologist. And uh, early on after I uh, left the Boston Children's Hospital, I was drafted into the U.S. Navy. Uh, at that time, they drafted all the doctors, and uh, they put me to work on uh, radiation injuries because at that time, the Navy was worried about uh, people on boats that had uh, these uh, reactors, and if anybody got exposed. And uh, over the years, we worked out uh, what you needed to do a transplant. We started the uh, National Marrow Donor Program, which uh, you may get to sign up for on your driver's license, and it's helped uh, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of people get uh, bone marrow transplants if they didn't have a uh, a match donor or a sibling. So that was uh, my introduction to immunology. And then I went on and did a PhD at the University of London. I did a lot of infectious diseases and immunology along the way and uh, eventually uh, helped start several companies, uh, joined, uh, went over to the dark side. I was in a VC group for about 15 years and helped start a bunch of companies. Some worked, some didn't. And then uh, more recently, my colleagues uh, asked me to join 180 Life Sciences. And the uh, individuals I'm working with, back in the, uh, back in the 90s, uh, I was the chief scientific officer of a company called Centicor. And we were the very first ones to make an anti-TNF drug. And my colleague, Dr. Mark Feldman in, uh, in London, uh, who I had studied with said that uh, he figured out that rheumatoid arthritis was driven by this uh, uh, inflammatory cytokine called tumor necrosis factor. And uh, we treated 10 patients with anti-TNF, the first ever, and uh, they actually got out of their wheelchairs, walked around. Unbelievable. Wow. We had no idea that it would be that uh, dramatic. And the rest is history. And now there's no patients in wheelchairs uh, with rheumatoid arthritis because of that drug and the follow on. And we also learned it worked in Crohn's disease and psoriasis and ulcerative colitis. So uh, there's now about eight or nine companies making uh, anti TNF drugs. It's the largest selling uh, class of biologics, about $40 billion per year. So that's a quick summary. And uh, I'm now head of 180 Life Sciences, and we're finding new indications for anti TNF, is what we're doing now. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a really interesting career. And, you know, whenever I think about, you know, all of the different experiences that you've had, um, out of the the journey that you've, that you've taken, what's the most impactful things that you've brought to 180 Life Sciences with you? Well, I think the, uh, obviously the most impactful thing was uh, when uh, at Senecor we developed uh, anti-TNF. Uh, at that time, uh, the uh, conventional wisdom that was that the people who were dying of sepsis uh, was because there was TNF around. 
and uh, we treated 50 patients with anti-TNF and it didn't do anything. So the conventional wisdom was incorrect. And actually afterwards, four or five other companies did the same thing and got the same result. And then the breakthrough in rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease and psoriasis, I think has helped more people than uh, probably any other thing that we've done. And that's a, that's a lot of personal pleasure uh, in uh, making sure people can live relatively normal lives, even if they have pretty substantial inflammatory disease. Yeah. yeah, but I would even think though, like given your your venture venture capital experience, um, the all of the the medical experience that you had even prior to, um, you know, coming to one eighty life sciences, you know, has to to have some sort of an impact as well in terms of your ability to lead that team because you understand a little bit more. I would say the broader picture, not just the the business side, but also the the science side as well. Yeah, I uh, went and did a PhD, so I understand the uh, science. And I'm, uh, as a pediatrician, I'm very patient centric. I was on the board of the Stanford Children's Hospital for about 15 years until about a year ago. And uh, very oriented to whatever we do, I want it to be very helpful to patients. Uh, and if it makes money, that's fine. If it doesn't, but it really helps them, that's fine too. But uh, the bottom line is here, it has to provide some real benefit to the patients we're trying to take care of, for sure. I remember whenever I was researching for this episode and, and trying to think about the questions that I would ask you and you know, kind of where we would go in the interview, the one thing that kept coming to mind to me is 180 Life Sciences is such an interesting name because, you know, kind of, I th- you know, I've heard like 360 Life Sciences. I lead, you know, 5280 Life Sciences, which deals with the elevation that I'm at. I'm near Denver, Colorado, so that's the elevation. Whenever I think of 180, it's, you know, about going backwards. But whenever I saw your mission, uh, it, it helped me make the tie, I would say. Um, you know, this idea of, of doing a 180 on inflammation um, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what led to the name and then, you know, what, you know, what is the organization trying to do with inflammation as well? Yeah. Uh, one of the ironies is that once uh, at Senecor with uh, Remicator and Fliximab, which was the uh, generic name, uh, worked out that it worked in rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's, psoriasis, and ulcerative colitis, all the other companies have uh, not moved the field very far. Uh, and they're all vying for that market. And uh, we said, you know, uh, of all the circulating proteins and cytokines you have in your body, the cytokines kind of tell cells what to do. Uh, The bad actor there is TNF, and it starts off the inflammation, which uh, can drive quite a lot of pain and fibrosis, et cetera. And we said, we're going to turn this around, and we're going to see if there's other indications where anti-TNF would be helpful to patients. And we found several, and uh, that's what we're working on uh, in our in our company. We're, we're turning this around and we're going after new, clear indications rather than trying to battle it out with the, uh, with the four or five that we identified earlier. Yeah, my mom, my mom's 92 now, and she's, uh, she has a lot of deformed, very deformed joints because of rheumatoid arthritis and has lived with it, you know, for years and, and, uh, you know, the, all of the effects. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that, that, you know, I definitely, you know, look forward to having better medicines that, you know, that treat these things as well, because, um, you know, as I look to getting older, you know, one of the things that could could obviously happen is I could wind up with it as well. Yeah, she probably takes uh, Humora. That's the uh, the most fashionable drug from AbV right now. It's a little better uh, than uh, Remicade in terms of uh, of therapy and and convenience. But uh, there's some patients where uh, Remicade just is the drug that works the best. And uh, why that is, we're not certain. It had very peculiar properties, but uh, even today it's a billion dollar a year drug for J&J. So uh, uh, it's still around and still being used. And you talk about older people. One of our indications is that uh, uh, in older patients who have a surgical procedure, whether it's a hip replacement or a coronary artery bypass graft or whatever, uh, a lot of them have fog and their mind after the surgery. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's called postoperative dementia. 
And up until now, the anesthesiologists have say, well, it's the long anesthesia, et cetera. We think differently. We think that the tissue damage releases TNF and that it opens up the blood brain barrier and allows inflammatory cells to get into the cognitive areas. Uh, about 20% of the patients don't recover. They end up in nursing homes. And so as we speak, we're starting a trial in uh, patients undergoing hip surgery and we're administering a single dose of anti-TNF at the time of surgery. And uh, in about a year from now, we'll be able to tell you whether we can prevent some of the post-operative dementia, which would be a, a huge benefit to a lot of patients, especially elderly ones. As myself, I'm getting older as well. I uh, don't want to have dementia, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a... Uh... It's a it's a really unfortunate thing because you you see in patients that have it, you know they they have their moments where they're absolutely clear, and then yeah. they have their moments where they just they really are disconnected and afraid, and and yeah. um, it's a really unfortunate um, sort of circumstance as well. And so you know anything that could help, you know, with that as well because I, you know obviously. Um, you know, lots of us live with a lot of different things in our lifetime and uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, a lot of different, uh, you know, things wind up, you know, just eventually creeping up on people and unexpectedly. And, you know, it'd be a real shame to have something like, you know, you go to, you go to have a joint surgery thinking that, you know, fixing the joint is going to be the end cure. And then all of a sudden, you know, you wake up only to find that there are some disconnects in your, in your memories that, you uh, you know, now all of a sudden you're not as not as clear as you used to be. It's exactly right. And uh, if we can provide a simple therapy that has no major side effects and uh, reduces that or eliminates it altogether, I think we've done a big favor for a lot of patients uh, who are elderly and undergoing all kinds of surgery. So we would see that as a huge benefit for uh, for all the patients. Yeah, I also wanted to mention, so we did get one comment and I'll pop it up here on the screen so you could see it as well. It's from Craig Rowski. He says, um, this goes back to whenever you were talking about Centacor's therapy. And uh, he's saying that, you know, he researched it as well in Amsterdam. And so I just wanted to bring that up, uh, you know, as well and just, you know, share with everybody the comment. Um, so your company's working on three families of drugs. Can you give us an overview of the programs and what stages they're currently in? Yeah, the uh, the uh, use of the anti-TNF uh, inhibitors. The, the first program is in, is working in a condition called Dupuytren's contracture, and this starts out as a very small nodule in the palm of your hand, hmm. uh, about the size of a dime or something, and uh, it becomes uh, more painful and it causes fibrous cords to pull your fingers together and you end up with a, a disabled hand and that you can't button your clothes, you can't play an instrument, you can't type. Uh, and uh, there's some therapies, but none of the therapies are used until actually you have the disability. And that's when you can get drugs like Zyaplex, which is a collagenase trying to dissolve these cords, or eventually uh, they go to surgery of one type or another, uh, which is what happened to my wife after a year of uh, steroid injections. And uh, the surgery generally works, but it's not perfect. Uh, our program, now that we know that TNF is driving these nodules to make these fibrous cords, we're injecting the TNF as soon as the nodule becomes apparent. And uh, the initial clinical trials showed that we could make the nodule smaller and in some cases, maybe even make it go away. And also, the uh, in in some cases, we don't have all the numbers yet, but uh, they didn't have to go to surgery for a long time versus those that got the placebo. So, we uh, we think we have a preventative therapy, which. Uh, uh, everybody I think would like to have because none, none of us want to wait around to see if our, uh, our hand is going to become uh, contracted. Nobody wants to do that. And uh, this is pretty simple therapy. It's a, an injection that takes maybe 10 minutes and uh, you have it three or four times a year and that's, uh, that's it. So uh, that's our first program and we're meeting with the, uh, with the uh, 
Food and Drug Administration and also the uh, British equivalent of the FDA called the MHRA because the trial was initially done in, in the UK, uh, asking them what we need to get this approved and available to, uh, to patients. And uh, they're uh, soon going to be mapping out what our strategy would be going forward. But uh, that program's on track. And for a, a young company to have a drug that's aimed towards approval with uh, maybe one more trial, I think is pretty good. So that's one. Uh, the second condition is called frozen shoulder, and the way it starts out is your shoulder is extremely painful, and that lasts for several months until you can't move it, and then it's frozen. The pain kind of decreases, but then you're, uh, you're immobile and uh, your shoulder doesn't work. It's more common in diabetics, and interestingly enough, about half of those patients have Dupuytrens, so we think that the fibrosis in the shoulder is driven by TNF just like the uh, fibrosis in the palm of the hand, and uh, we'll be initiating trials in frozen shoulder. At present, as I talk to my orthopedic surgeon colleagues, there just isn't much they can do for frozen shoulder outside of the surgery at the end, and the rehab is months and months and months after the surgery. So uh, perhaps we can help those patients by preventing the whole disability as well. So that's one. And then I, I already mentioned the post-operative dementia uh, trials that'll get off the ground uh, moving forward. So those are the three programs we have in the anti-TNF area. And we're thinking of other things uh, where anti-TNF might be helpful, but we haven't gotten those off the ground. We've got enough on our plate to speak, uh, speak about it just right now. Yeah, I had an employee, I think he was about 38 years old that had frozen shoulder. I remember... Um, you know, you know, extremely young to have such a problem. Um, but, you know, he, he went to his doctor. There were things that they were trying to do again, um, but nothing like nothing like your therapy. And who knows whether or not if it's continued to to bother him. But I remember, you know, he was he was before even 40 in his in his lifespan and, and looking at, at such a critical, um, you know, sort of thing. And, and I remember just thinking, you know, I could only imagine what your, you know, what your time later in life will be, you know, if you're already having these sorts of issues. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we initially tried to do trials in the UK, but the uh, UK system is different in that the patients uh, aren't referred to doctors. They're sent to physical therapists, and the physical therapists weren't so interested in being involved in trials. In the U.S., that's not the case. They all go to uh uh, orthopedic uh, physicians and are treated there. And uh, as I talk to them, they're very eager for some kind of therapy to prevent the uh, disability from uh, from forming. So I think uh, when we start trials in the U.S., it'll be quite uh, quite attractive for people to become involved. Uh, it's uh, often seen more in diabetics and uh, uh, a variety of other other uh, comorbidities, but that uh, that will work out as we go forward. Yeah, and I, I mean, as you as you look at the 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 next few years, right? When is the soonest that somebody would actually see one of these drugs in the market? Then, potentially. Well, I think if uh, depending on uh, what comes back from the regulatory agencies, the FDA and the MHRA, uh, as to what they need for uh, making an approval and uh, allowing us to offer the drug. It's probably a couple of years would be kind of average, maybe a little longer, maybe a little shorter. Uh, I don't know. We're waiting for the uh, advice from them to come back. Uh, same for the US FDA. They may want two trials. That's uh, common. Uh, and so uh, we're all uh, under the uh, guidance of the regulatory agencies to make sure that the therapy is safe and effective. But that's the, uh, that's the nature of the system. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks you can do things quickly. Well, you can only do it quickly when they let you do it quickly. So uh, one has to be cautious, make sure no patients are harmed, and also that the outcomes are beneficial to the, uh, the patients that you're treating. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and I mean, obviously, you know, being safe and, and making sure that, that we're um, that there aren't any other, you know, unknown side effects and things are important. And, um, but I think about the future of, you know, the impact that these drugs could have as well and uh, look forward to, to seeing that uh, impact out in the market. 
Yeah, you mentioned on the chat that uh, there's new drugs for psoriasis and now IL-17. There's a whole host of biologics and also small molecules coming along that sort of uh, build on the therapy that from uh, the anti-TNFs that we generated, but that's fine. I'm uh, happy that there's uh, there's progress in the area with, with new drugs uh, that would be coming forward. So, so good, good for patients. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I like to take a little bit of time and try and understand you and some of the um, some of the growth that you've experienced throughout your life as well. In terms of the greatest leadership advice that you've ever received, I just would would love to hear you know what advice you've received in your lifetime that that had the greatest impact on you. Yeah, well, you know, when I uh, finished my residency and the Navy. Uh, took me in and uh, wanted me to stay. Uh, of course, my mother wanted me to be a general pediatrician in some town close to her. Yeah. <laughs> mothers, as mothers often do. Uh, and it didn't work out that way. And uh, I took up the challenge of uh, treating these radiation injuries. And because all the transplants we did initially in Bethesda Naval Hospital, they all died of graft versus host disease. And so that's when I said, we don't understand what's going on. And I had to go back to London and, and work on human immunology and begin to understand more about the uh, uh, immune system and what we could do. And that's how we founded the uh, national marrow donor program and what antigens had to be matched. And now this is moving forward and people can get transplants uh, these days. Uh, so I, I guess the advice to people is that from time to time, you get offered opportunities where you may be unsure whether you're able to do it. Uh, and uh, in my mind, you should take the chance and you should work hard and be smart and uh, learn as much as you can. Uh, you might not be totally successful, but you also uh, store up a, a whole whole band of knowledge as to uh, what works and what doesn't work. So that that's one thing. And don't shy away from new opportunities that you can uh, take forward. And the other uh, the other advice uh, of all the people is uh, for biotechnology and everything else is be lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, who would have ever guessed that these patients with rheumatoid arthritis would have gotten out of their wheelchairs after a single infusion of one drug? Uh, you know, that uh, was uh, was amazing. And uh, uh, every, every once in a while uh, that happens, you know, as I look at, say, Alzheimer's disease, we really don't know what's going on there. And despite all the trials and all of the massive amounts of money in it, we really don't understand what the dynamics are. And somebody's going to have a flash of insight and say, this is how it works. And uh, at that point, we'll all be on whatever medicine that is. Because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to forget any more passwords. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I could tell you still at, at I, I'm what 55 now and at 55, I have to have a password manager because there's just too many of them and they're, they're, they keep getting longer and longer to try and keep people out. So I don't blame well, you for that one. Well, this is the cognitive test these days. How, how, long, <laughs> how many you have to write and stick on your computer or uh, have your password manager? Right. Yeah, exactly. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? Uh, well, I think uh, as a pediatrician, you're, you're very interested in the health of, uh, uh, of children who often can't speak for themselves, and it's a it's a uh, it's a kind of an attitude that uh, that drives you to do the best you can for any patients that you can, and uh, in so far as we're able to do that, I'm I'm happy to try, and even though I don't know all the answers, I'm willing to uh, spend a lot of energies trying to uh, trying to help people going forward with whatever technologies that we can bring bring to bear. So that kind of drives me on a personal basis. And I'm not one who wants to retire or anything, especially if I can make any contributions <laughs> going forward. And uh, that seems to be the case. So, uh, so far, so good. I have other companies I work with, some in autism, some in, uh, in, in different uh, areas of inflammation, but uh, it, they're all aimed at the same thing of providing benefit to, uh, to patients going forward. So important. What concerns you? Uh, I, I think the, uh, I, I think 
the thing that concerns me most, and when I was on the board of the Children's Hospital, I managed their quality and safety committee, and which related to what was the outcome for the patients. Uh, did they do well? Did they have problems, et cetera? And I, I actually spent quite a lot of time uh, talking to the clinicians taking care of them. And their complaint was that they had to fill out endless numbers of forms, that they had moved all of the patient care activities away from them and uh, they only had a limited amount of time to actually talk to their patients because they had to fill out their forms on their epic systems or whichever whichever system they had to use and uh, that worried them all because they were getting away from uh, the classic part of medicine which is talking to your patients and taking care and find out what they really are concerned about and taking the time to uh, to uh, provide whatever benefit you can because they were pushed by the system and the reporting structures uh, of the hospital systems to spend a lot of time on paperwork. That's, yeah. and I see that continuing. I, I, I don't see a, uh, a way around it. And uh, that's, uh, that's disappointing. Uh, lots of times you can go see your, your doctor and uh, they never even touch you. Mm. They're sitting there at a computer and they're talking to you a little bit while they're typing, uh, filling out their forms at the same time. I find that uh, disappointing from the way I was trained uh, as an intern and resident and as a practicing physician. Yeah, it's interesting to me, the, the, the differences between different physicians as well. And I don't know how, I don't know how different physicians handle the paperwork aspect of it. Cause I've never, I've never asked that question, but I think it, I think it'd be a good question maybe for the, the next time I see this, but um, I was with a, with a friend in the hospital and uh, the physician came in and sat down in a chair and actually had an in-depth conversation in the, in the hospital. Um, didn't stare at the computer. They had somebody else that came in along the way and they, they definitely were taking care of some paperwork, but I will, I just wonder, you know, was that physician able to have somebody that, you know, helps to support the paperwork? Um, but you know, I, it's one of those things where occasionally you see it now. Um, and whenever you talked about, you know, kind of earlier in your career, you know, being in a small town and, you know, being a, a, a general pract general practitioner, um, you know, I just kind of see those folks today. I mean, they're completely swallowed by paperwork because they, they're always staring at the computer, even whenever they're trying their best, you know, to connect with you while you're there. Um, the one, the one thing that Craig was asking as well in the, in the chat was, uh, you know, how do you feel about telehealth? What is your, um, what is your, you know, thoughts around, around that as well? Uh, yeah, I have some uh, some thoughts about uh, telehealth. What what's happening in some situations uh, is they actually send a scribe along with you. Ah, okay. It's trying to build uh, AI computer programs to uh, listen to what the patient's saying and try to transcribe that. So uh, all of this is kind of cooking along. Uh, it hasn't hit prime time yet, but it's uh, it's coming, and I could see that as a potential uh, potential solution. Interestingly enough. We asked some of the uh, the children at the children's hospital to draw a picture of their doctor, and so the one picture we got was the back of a head against a computer. That was, <laughs> that was the doctor, <laughs> and, it, and it just made the case, you know, that that's uh, that's what it was really really like. Uh, I think the telemedicine actually is effective, uh, and uh, I I think that once you're seen personally by a physician, that lots of times you can follow up. Uh, with a, uh, uh, a Zoom call or whatever whatever uh, format you use to follow up on the results and things and things to do so you can talk with them and actually see them. Uh, and that's very helpful because it's very time uh, uh, time effective and uh, it, it's convenient. Now, and a lot of our patients were long ways away. Mm -hmm. So for them to come into the hospital was a huge problem. It took, you know, sometimes a couple of days to get in, get a hotel, whatever they were going to do. And for some people, that was very difficult. So I think in some instances, this is, uh, is quite, uh, 
quite valuable. But at some point, you really need to see a hands-on physician and be really examined. Uh, that's that's the key to start with, I, I think. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Here's the last question. What excites you? Uh, what excites me is, is the next generation of anti-inflammatory agents. And it, it turns out that there's two different receptors for TNF. And when TNF binds to one of the receptors, it causes the inflammation. And when TNF binds to the other receptor, it's anti-inflammatory. And what we're doing now is we're blocking all the TNF from binding to anything. Mm. And uh, that has some problems uh, with infectious diseases, uh, makes you a little more susceptible. And every one of the anti-TNF inhibitors and even the small molecule TNF inhibitors all have the same warning that you're more susceptible to infections. Uh, maybe we can find a way to shut down the inflammatory one and turn on the anti-inflammatory one and avoid some of those things and get the patient benefit. And the idea that we might be able to do that in the future is actually quite exciting to me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I, I, look at, I look forward to seeing a lot of the things that you're currently working on at 180 Life Sciences. And Dr. Jim Woody, thank you so much for being with us and, and sharing everything that you're currently working on. Don, I appreciate your, uh, your nice uh, podcast and the, uh, actually the quite good questions you had. It's very good. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.